might help if I turn the mic on. So I am, this is my gigging kit. This is the Tom from my gigging kit. It is a eight by 12, eight by 12, um, I wish I knew what it was. Eight by 12, I believe it is six ply oak with um, six ply maple re-rings. Yeah, it's definitely eight by 12. Uh, Bucks County with a really cool blue finish. Um, this was the early version of the Prime Series. Now they have straight shells, but this one has re-rings. I've used this on every gig since the beginning of the year. I changed the heads back in January, and I'm getting to the end of the gig season, the hefty gig season. So I don't want to change the heads yet, but what I want to do, because the last gig, where was that? It was an outdoor band shell type of thing, very concrete, you know, a concrete stage and like a big amphitheater. Um, and it was just starting to sound a little bit out. So I want to go through and just kind of retune and refresh. Uh, BB Photo, can't stay for this. Before I forget, check out the Jazz Fusion track. Phil Collins on drums, Brand X, Born Ugly. Absolutely will check it out. I've been on a bit of a Phil Collins kick recently, uh, mostly with his playing with Genesis. So I will definitely check that out. I think he's starting to go a little bit forgotten as a drummer. Um, the Genesis stuff is just so fun and cool and not overly kind of written out. I'll definitely check it out. Thank you. Brand X, Born Ugly. So the bottom head I've got kind of re... It, was, it wasn't really out. It was like two lugs that had gotten a little bit higher than the others. It's all sitting right around an A. So, I want to see where the batter head is in relation to that. Because this is the head that every gig I'm kind of quickly detuning lugs and stuff just to get it to sound better in different rooms. Take the gels off. Really not. They're pretty close to the same. Flat A. Let's bring it up. And both heads are reading 224 hertz. Turn the filter off. Or the filter. On. Okay. I also want to try to get this rack tom to sound a little bit more jazzy for a gig I have coming up this weekend. I'll be doing a lot of swing stuff. Yeah, if I can, I always tune with a timpani mallet. This happens to be a Promark PST4 staccato. So it's not super fluffy. All right, I'm not gonna go insane about it, but that's pretty close. Let me just put it on the kit. Hit it and see what we got. So in theory, with both heads tuned to the same note, it should be pure and then it should have the longest possible resonance given the tension that the heads are under. But sometimes it's not the best sound.
All right, stream's over. Sounds great. Seriously, there is a bit of an overtone I know in certain rooms will be annoying. Let's see what pitch it is though. Not surprisingly, it's right in between a C and a C sharp, which is where I tend to like 12 inch toms when I'm going for a higher sound. So I have two options here. If I want to get this up to a C sharp, which is where I wanted to put it, I could either tune up the batter head and make that would mean the batter head is higher than the bottom, or I can tune up the bottom head. I like the way it feels. So I'm not going to screw with the top head. I'm going to just bring up the bottom head a little bit till I get a C sharp. It'd probably be a tiny, tiny little change. There it is, C sharp. Well, that didn't take long at all. I thought it was gonna give me a headache because it started to sound on the last gig that um, the heads were kind of getting to the end of their, their life cycle. Starting to get a little bit of like wobbliness, but we really just had to kind of bounce out a couple lugs. And for some reason I had two gels on this thing, but in this room, that's way too much. Here's one gel. Done deal. G1 coated on top, an old G1 coated because I put it on in January. So it is seen a lot of action. It's not dented. Yeah, there's starting to be a tiny little bit of little denting. Definitely a lot of stick marks. The coating is not wearing off, but it's starting to flatten out a bit. Bottom head is a clear G1. One gel on top does exactly what I wanted to do, which is just kind of soften the bite. I'll put this other gel on the bottom. These drums, for whatever reason, tend to need just a little bit of dampening on the bottom. The problem with putting gels on the bottom is they inevitably fall off. But there's with the gel on the bottom. So I think for a very live room that might work. In this space, it's too much. So I'm gonna do my patented trick and just put the spare gel on the shell under the tom bracket. So if I need it, it's there. Um, what would you tune it to for traditional jazz or bebop? How much higher? Um, good question. Um, F? C F, it would go up to an F. I would have, essentially I would have my 14 tuned to where this 12 is. 
and then I would take the 12 up to an F. So the bass drum is an F, floor tom is a C, rack tom is an F, snare drum goes above that to like an A flat. So it's like a minor, an F minor um, triad with the fifth in the bass. So it would be, um, what is that? A major third higher on the rack tom. For a bebop sound, which is really high, and it it's designed to minimize the the volume. That type of tuning is is a much more controlled sound. Very little sustain. Lots of quick attack. Very responsive at low dynamics. This is more kind of a I would say big band Motown kind of tuning. Still high, medium high, I would say. If I go any lower, then it'll start to kind of fatten out and get kind of more punchy, and um, that's not the sound I'm looking for for this for this gig. It's like swing music, shuffles, blues, Motown. Um, I wanted to kind of that classic, not too high, but high rack tom. That's so. All I did was I got. I just found where the bottom head was already sitting. It was like an A, but slightly sharp, 225 hertz, I believe, at the tension rod overtone. Matched the batter head to that. So then I knew the whole drum was at least in balanced and in tune with itself. Listened to it, notated what I was hearing, which was a little bit of bite in the overtone, and the pitch needed to come up a bit. So I liked the way it felt, so I adjusted the bottom head higher. If it would have felt a little too firm, I would have detuned when I wouldn't have gotten me there. If it would have felt kind of soggy on top, I would have adjusted the batter head up to get to the C sharp. But it felt great, nice and responsive, but still kind of soft. So I used the bottom head to bring it up to pitch. I would try to tune the batter head for feel and then use the bottom head to just sustain an overall pitch more more often. Um, so I mean literally that took five minutes. Cool for me. I think I need to go get the floor tom and, and fix that bad boy which was really um, the one that was giving me the most trouble at the gig. It was just starting to kind of sound kind of warbly. Uh, so let me go grab that drum and I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. How do I feel about cotton balls inside the head for dampening? Um, I don't tend to do it. I have done it. I think it really works best in the floor tom just to get the bottom head to stop vibrating with every bass drum hit. I don't think of it, sorry, let me get this fixed. I don't think of cotton balls in the drum as dampening. I think of that as more like a gate. So like the floor tom on big stages where um, everything's mic'd up, 
I mean, you've got a floor tom, you've got a mic on every drum and everything. Um, the floor tom will sympathetically resonate a ton, which can be a pain in the butt for the front of house. The cotton ball will keep that bottom head from sustaining as much. And then you don't have to gate it as, as aggressively. So I think of cotton balls inside the drum more as a gating option to control sympathetic hum. It's not really dampening because the, the heads are still open. Dampening is like a tone control for me, not a, a sustained control most often. Um, yeah, floor toms can definitely be boingy. This one was starting to just sound kind of like fuzzy and just weird. So something got out of balance. So let's see where the bottom head is. This one has gels on top and bottom. So it must have been giving me grief on one of those stages. And using the TuneBot, I am listening. I'm, I'm checking the Hertz that it's reading. I'm also just intuitively, I could tell that was lower. The, the TuneBot reaffirmed it. You're always kind of chasing. My, at least what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to chase the highest one, which often means I'm constantly adjusting everything else. So you're hearing that in my lavalier mic pretty loud. Yeah, this is the TuneBot Studio. I don't know when they came out with this version, but it kind of got rid of some of the, it kind of combined everything into one screen, so you don't have to change views to go from pitch to hertz. It's got some color options, so you can see a little bit easier when it's hitting your desired note and all that. Um, but I have the original one here. Uh, this is the original one. And then there's another one that Pearl, Pearl Drums put out that's, that's gray. It's like a simplified version. They all basically do the same thing. It's just a microphone reading with a very limited frequency range. I don't know why people freak out about it. It's just a, a chromatic tuner. And if you have the tool, why not use it? be deceiving. All right, 145 on the bottom. So I'm just going to match the top. I bet it's way, way, way below that because I've been detuning this drum lately. Tons of freaking gels on it. I'm really just trying to mitigate the hum and also just make it sound fatter for some of the more modern stuff. That's quite a bit under. I'll bring the whole thing up. Eighth of a turn. It's probably the Subaru dealership. I mean, it's a testament to two things here. The quality of Evan's heads, because, I mean, I've, I'm really cavalier when I get to the gig. Like, oh, it sounds too boingy. I just, like, aggressively detune lugs to get it to work in whatever room I'm in quickly. Like, in 30 seconds, I have to have this thing kind of sounding good in the room. And then a testament to just the quality of these drums, too. 
and it is tuned right up. 145 all the way around. I've played, I don't know, 100 gigs on this freaking thing. I'll take all the gels off. I might go with just like a dampening ring moving forward. So interestingly, that's, that's sitting at like a, a flat F. I want this drum to be at an F sharp. If you remember, the rack tom was at a flat C, so I had to bring up the bottom head to get it to C sharp. I want this one to sit at an F sharp. So I'm gonna bring up the bottom head, do the same method. I think at most, I did an eighth of a turn. That pretty much did it. About an eighth of a turn, once I had them matched, um, it was about an eighth of a turn up on the bottom head to get it up um, at a minor, a minor second to the F sharp. So I want to just steal the legs off of my relic kit here. So let me take off the stick bag. Maybe, okay, give me a second here. I want to rob these legs. <clears throat> Gonna yank anything out? Let's see. Okay, one. The irony is I have probably 50 sets of four tom legs in garage and storage. But I'm too lazy to go get them. Alright. What am I gonna do with this? Put it over here. My mic is about to yank off. Come on. This is how you throw your back out, folks. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, I went to see my buddy Brian Wolf play a gig here with his kind of New Orleans funk band, and we were geeking out over tuning. Because he had just, that was the first time he'd used his bigger Ludwig kit, 13, 16, 22, and tuned it up for that kind of, like, New Orleans, the meters kind of sound. Um, and it sounded amazing. And the pitches he had were F sharp and C sharp in the toms, which is why I'm sealing it right now. Um, let's take the gel off the bottom head, too. Ooh, this is, that's gonna have to stay there. Not my favorite dampener. Won't mention who it is, but it's not good. Um, okay. So this should be, now that the legs are on it, it might be off. F sharp, C sharp. I love the UV heads. The UV1s are great. The UV2s are my favorite for like big rock sounds, like deep and punchy. Um, I have those on my my big kit, 13, 16, 18, 24. The UV2s sound amazing. UV1s are great too. 
Um, just honestly, I don't need the extra durability on toms, so I use the UV-1 most often on the snare. Um, if I use the UV-1, it'll be on the snare most of the time. Or the bass drum, because that tends to wear out quick too. There's a UV um, um, EQ-4 that sounds amazing. But on toms, the G1s or sometimes the G2s um, are all I need. But the UV2s are, are really great. So it's just a tiny little bit of fuzz in the tone, which is usually when the gel helps. So that's with two gels on top. I feel, personally, feel like the two gels makes this drum match better with the 12 inch that has the one gel. Just It kind of reined it in, shortened the decay a little bit, rounded out those kind of bitey, um, papery overtones. And also knowing there's going to be a microphone stuck right on here and, and chances are the audio engineer is not going to be uh, wanting to spend a ton of time EQing and all that stuff. So this helps kind of bring it more into like PA ready. Do you always play with one up, one down? I mean, yeah, I would say gigging wise, 100% of the time. Sometimes I just use a floor tom. Sometimes I don't use any toms, but... Um, I can't think of the last time where I purposely took more than two toms to a gig. Literally. Can't think. It would have to go back many, many years. Obviously, in sessions, I will put up whatever I need to play the parts that I need to play. Um, but, yeah, usually rack tom, floor tom, if I add anything, it's snare drums like I have on this kit. If I pull anything away, it'll be the rack tom. Now this snare is probably going to sound really weird with these toms, but... Should be a minor third up, let's see.
major third up. It's an F. I should point out this is a 15 inch floor tom, by the way. So it's 12, 15. Um, so I can kind of force it to fit in either high like this, more of a bebop kind of Motown sound or super low for kind of the kind of kick drum, small kick drum kind of vibe. Um, so right now it's kind of in that higher zone. have to tune the toms a little bit higher than I would for a typical pop or rock gig because um, because I need to be able to play quietly. So this kit needs to be able to do cocktail hour kind of Duke Ellington and um, Joe Beam Bossa Novas, that kind of stuff, like light brushes and light sticks to um, oldies, which is still kind of an older sound, lighter touch, 60s Motown, um, big band Frank Sinatra stuff, 70s funk, um, 80s Michael Jackson, and then some more contemporary stuff. So I've, I've found it's better to tune them for the quieter stuff so you get a, a decent tone and a, a, a softer dynamic.
versus tuning them big and punchy and modern. But then when you try to play quietly on it, it just sounds like a wet paper bag. So I tune medium high, and that seems to cover everything that I need it to cover on these particular gigs. Now, if I'm doing something that's all big and fluffy, hard hitting stuff, close mic'd, very detailed front of house mix, I'll tune it down. I'll probably dampen it even more, use some t uh, like uh, shop rags kind of taped on or something like that. Um, and then let the mics do a lot of the work. But a lot of these gigs, the it might be a kick drum mic, might be a snare mic, sometimes tom mics. So I want the I want the toms to speak as much as they can acoustically. This is the my gigging kit is a 20, but this is still the 22 relic. The the kit the, the kick that matches these toms is a 20, 15 by 20. Sounds amazing. Um, yes, I do endorse Evans and Promark. Um, and, and they have a pretty extensive catalog of Tempe mallets. These are their performer series, and they have another, um, all the Jonathan Haas signature stuff, which has like a, a cherry stain. They're all great. Um, I have found everything I need with Promark, personally, and with Evans. The one thing that Evans doesn't make, which is because of copyright issues, is a good dotted head like the um, Remo CS coated snare head is really great. And the Evans one just doesn't, the power center reverse dot doesn't sound as good and it doesn't feel as good. That's the one thing Evans doesn't have. But everything else I love, Promark, I've tried everything in the 5A, 5B, 7A, 2B range. So many cool options. These are still the Carter McLean's that I, I broke out last week. Get this tuning, I can play lightly and it's still giving me a nice tone. Definitely like a uh, all-purpose medium-high tuning, John Bonham-ish, but smaller drums, Motown, all the Motown drum sounds look kind of like this. Al Jackson with a, a lot of the stack stuff sounds like this. Um, yeah, so that's it. No other questions. I'm going to hop off, get go pick up my car for an out-of-town gig this weekend. I'll be back on tomorrow. Tomorrow's Wednesday. Goodness. And, um, yeah, I have some other stuff I want to do on here, but, um, uh, would love to see if you have all your auxiliary percussion kit. I used to have a hybrid kit that I gigged with all the time. I used to do a ton of duo gigs where I would use a kick drum, a snare drum, a hi-hat, one cymbal, usually like a super thin 20 or an 18, a cajon that I'll sit on, which I would never do it again, but for those gigs I did that. Congas for the toms, a djembe over here, um, and then tons of shakers and tambourines and stuff. It was a lot of fun. Very rarely do I gig with a cowbell, but I have to start playing a bunch of cha-chas here soon.
Yeah, maybe I'll set up like, a, and I had, and then the other kit, which was super fun that I designed for the more kind of electronic alternative bands I was playing in. Kick with the trigger, main snare with the trigger, this tiny 12 inch guy over here for kind of like drum and bass snare drum sounds with the jingle hit. Roland SPDS sample pad in the front so I could start and stop loops and play samples and it was also what was tr housing the triggered sounds for the kick and snare. Um, sometimes a floor tom. X hat like this. One or two cymbals that I would do stacks and things. Hi hat with all sorts of stuff. That was a fun kit because I was blending live drumming with electronic sounds and loops, not using a click track, but like starting and stop shakers or different like electronic loops that we would create. So we could play as a band, but the rhythm section sounded like it was programmed, making it kind of hit a little bit harder through the PA and then we could change the kick samples in every song. We would change the snare samples in every song. That was a ton of fun. Um, that kit felt like my kit, like something unique that I had developed. And those bands dissolved, unfortunately. But this kit that I put together for this gig with Jeff Taylor is kind of feeling a little bit like, oh, I found a, I found a vibe. It's sort of ambidextrous because I'm going to be playing a couple times with the right on this snare over here and left on the remote hat or like this with different things. So it just kind of feels kind of cool. Um, no double kick pedal, though. Um, that would be the next thing I would tackle whenever I need to do some double kick. It hasn't come up in many, many years, anyone asking me to play double kick. Um, all right, I've got to go. Thank you for logging in. These drums sound cool to me. I think they're all set. Um, hopefully you learned something. I get both heads the exact same frequency, and then I adjust usually the bottom head to get the pitch I want. Or if the feel is weird, I'll mess with the top head. Um, don't forget Brand X Born Ugly on it. I'm going to put that on right now as I'm getting set up for my next project here. So have a good day. I'll see you tomorrow noonish.